take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, the agenda is very simple. I'm going to preach the Word to you. We're going to show you the video. And uh, I don't know if you saw what was going on before the service, but Joshua, one more time, save my biscuits. And the, uh, I can't blame Pastor Valiente for not working because he's not here. But uh, <clears throat> got it working, and so we should be okay. Should be great with the video. Wonderful. Isn't that right? Let's think happy thoughts. Lots of happy thoughts. This is officially called the report about the pastor's Taiwan mission trip. And I'd like to give just straightforward tonight. I want to start by just thanking the church, thanking the deacons, and especially Dave Frost for encouraging me to take this trip. For several years, we kind of put it to the background, honestly, because of finances, wise, good reason. But Dave stayed on it, and he said, hey, you know, all the missionaries come in, the missions directors really encouraged the pastor to take a missions trip, and it was a good thing. It cost money, yeah, it did. But spiritually, uh, I believe that there, were, there was a great result. And, um, you know, I don't think we turn, set the world on fire or anything like that, but I think that it will benefit me, and it will benefit the church, and uh, definitely the missionary, and uh, our missions emphasis in this church. Missions emphasis in this church. It's a very odd thing that when Amy and I uh, went to check in, we dropped our kids off in Morgantown. We dropped, that's the girls, so we went to drop the, uh, the boys off in Pittsburgh. We were flying out of Pittsburgh. Our sister was meeting us there in Pittsburgh, so we're staying in the, at the night in Pittsburgh, flying out early in the morning, dropping off the boys. They were meeting us at the hotel. My niece went along, as some of you know. She raised her own support. She went along. And uh, so I'm walking up to the desk. I walk up to the Comfort Inn, you know. Here I am, walking up to the Comfort Inn. And there's a fella, big old fella, who walks up to the desk. You know, I'm in Pittsburgh. I'm in the middle of nowhere, right? And no offense, but and he's walking up to the desk. And he says, uh, the woman says, what's your name? And she, he says, Robert Barker. And I look over. I look, and it wasn't Bob Barker. <laughs> Price is right. It was Bob Barker, but it wasn't Bob Barker. And uh, I grew up with a fella not with a fellow, and grow up with him, a pastor that used to take a bunch of teenagers to Sword of the Lord conferences. His name was Bob Barker, and that was the man. And I said, I didn't say a word, I said, are you a preacher? And he said, I am a preacher. And then he, he turned to me, and we saw each other, and his assistant pastor was a young man that was younger than me that I went to school with in high school, Christian high school. Very, isn't that odd? He was flying out to like somewhere, I couldn't even, Cuba. He was going to Cuba on a pastor's missions trip. And I was excited. I asked him, how, I said, how's your church going? And you know what he told me? I thought, great. He didn't refer to numbers or anything like that. He referred to faith promise missions. That was his answer to me. He said, phenomenal. You know, we're giving $196,000 to faith promise missions. That's what he tells me. I'm like, what? <laughs> He's got a church of about 180. How does a church of 180 give $196,000 to missions? I have no idea. But I just, sit, I just stood there and said, huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. But what an odd thing. It started out, the trip started out weird, just like it was. Let's go to the Lord, and then we'll go to the, to the Word. Father in heaven, thank you for this night. Help us, O oh God. Empower the Word of God. Help this time, just a family time together, to be good. And I ask, O oh God, you'll push all weirdo things aside. Dear Father, Satan would love to have a bad spirit permeated in this auditorium, in this church. He would love to have discouragement to be permeated. He would love for us to get our eyes upon ourselves. He would love for us to get skeptical. But, oh God, you're greater. How pure your way is, how loving it is to be a Christian, how good is honesty and righteousness and purity and judgment. And I ask, oh God, that you would just keep us in the Holy Spirit tonight. Let us walk in the Spirit that we might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In Jesus' name. Amen. IBFL quadrupled, or not, I don't know what you say, 200% in attendance, whatever. When you go from zero to two, buddy, you're flying. And a young couple in IBFL this afternoon, a nucleus of the new church, Spanish church. Anderson was falling apart. He didn't know what to do. <laughs> Somebody's here. Amen. It's good stuff. Some of you can't get excited about two people. Listen, when you preach two weeks to nobody, two people looks awful good, doesn't it? Amen. It's good. The Bible says in Acts chapter 14, if you would stand with me in verse number 23. Let me back up to verse 20. Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city 
And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. This is the Apostle Paul after he'd been stoned. Look at verse 21. When he had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium, to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, that's pastors, they had prayed with, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed throughout Poseidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia and, and thence sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended. That's, that is that they had been sent uh, to the grace of God for the work which they, had, they, which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. You may be seated. That's what we're doing tonight. That is kind of a, an account here of Paul and Barnabas finishing up their first missionary journey and returning to their sending church, Antioch, to give account. You know, this is the foundational principle of why I don't believe in missionary clearinghouses. I believe that a missionary ought to be responsible to a church, to a sending church, and really the responsibility of accountability. Uh, that a missionary is not rogue, he's not on his own, he doesn't go over there supported by all these churches and then never give account. And it's awful nice when the missionaries come back to come through here and to give account. I like that, it's a good thing. It's a biblical thing. So tonight I'd like to make myself accountable to you and give account of our trip. I don't want to just tell you stories and give you a video, I want to tell you my inner thoughts and the spiritual work that I believe was accomplished through this trip. And I want to begin, though, by giving a challenge. I want to lay it out, lay the gauntlet out. I want to encourage every man. I'd like to encourage every family, but especially every man, that you not finish your time on this earth without going on a mission trip. You know, whatever, you, whatever, whatever you have to do, whether you have to raise your own support or whether you have to put aside money until, for several years until you have enough to go, I want to encourage every, especially young couples, that you would go on a mission trip to visit one of our missionaries on a foreign field in your lifetime. You would just set it as a goal of your life that you're going to do it. It will change your life. It will change your realism as, as an American. It will change every time we have a missions conference. You will be different. You will think differently. It will change your life. It really will. And I want to encourage you that you would please take a missions trip. I've been to Romania and to Brazil and uh, went to some inner uh, uh, American uh, uh, city mission trips, New York City and inner city Philadelphia, and now to Taiwan. And I want to tell you, it's just a life-changing thing. And I want to encourage you that you would try to go. Maybe it would be a men's work trip or an evangelistic effort. Some of you guys have talked up the idea of a men's work trip sometime. Okay, who's going to step forward? Who's going to organize it? You know, I'll, I'll announce it up here and I'll say, yeah, hey, let's go. You know, I'll encourage you to go. But who's going to step up and say, okay, who's going with me? All right? Somebody do that. Some guy, let's do it. Let's just do it. Missions is very much worth it. I want to report to you seven experiences of this trip, spiritual experiences. And I'm just going to go boom, 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 boom. It's not going to be long tonight. Number one, <clears throat> this uh, experience, this trip, we were reminded that ministry involves individual people as well as programs, as growth, accomplishments, or buildings. We we're reminded about individual people and how important that is in ministry. This experience uh, of individual people will probably be of the greatest benefit to Lighthouse. You'll remember when the first deacons of Acts chapter 6 were appointed that the apostles gave themselves continually to what? What? Yell it out. To prayer and the what? The min yet, well, you missed a point. Prayer and the ministry of the word. All right. They gave themselves holy. It says it's not meat that we should serve tables. Okay? It doesn't make sense that we should, should do this individual stuff. We'll give ourselves holy to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Okay, what's that mean? Well, prayer is obviously a personal thing. The ministry of the Word is that they studied the Scriptures, they were changed, and then ministered the Word. They took the Word of God to individual people. They counseled. They went to people's homes. They talked with people after church, after services. They ministered the Word that they had spent time in through the week. And I was reminded how important it is that ministry never get beyond individual people how important individual people are. The ministry of the Word involved first the pastor's heart, but then giving that Word to other people. One of the hard things for the Pans, Luke and Dina Pan is who we went to, to, to see, 
Uh, Luke and Dina. Dina is the Frost daughter, if you don't know that. And Luke was a national. He, he was not an American in any way. I mean, he was born in Taiwan, and he did not go the American circuit at all. He was educated in seminary, Bible seminary in Taiwan. One of the hard things for the Pans is not seeing their church grow. Very hard. After five plus, I believe it is, faithful year, years, they have a handful of people. And just like America, the rich and the charismatic and contemporary style churches snatch up anyone who professes to be a Christian. And I want to be very honest with you how hard it is for they have a nice little building that's on a corner of, of a back road of, of, of an inner city. And, you know, how hard it is to labor and to labor and to labor and labor faithfully, godly giving the word of God and not see, you know, what Americans would, would deem as a full church house and a successful ministry. You know, I'm really not sure what these writers of books would do if they actually had to be on the mission field and experience reality of hard ministry. But Luke and I spoke at length about the discouragement that that brings. He told me about his consolation, and I was so encouraged as he told me of the few girls in the, in the children's home that Dina, and Dina runs that uh, they're able to minister to. I want to make it very clear what this is. They bring young troubled ladies into their home, and Dina ministers to them. They make them part of the family, two, three. They've had several into their home. And just one-on-one, -on -one, daily, reality of discipleship. They live Christ before them. One 14-year-old girl has just, a few months ago, trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior in their home. And he's telling me about the consolation. And Luke was telling me about the consolation that it was for him to be able to invest himself in these young people. But you don't know what it's like to come week after week to a church, year after year, and to just have a handful. You don't know what that does to your heart. Anderson, he's starting to feel like what it fit. It's rough, isn't it, brother? But I want to tell you, Luke got a hold of something, and he said, he said you know, Pastor Toby, however he says it, he said, you know, I, I, we, have we have at least changed some. Some. Isn't that ministry, folks? Isn't that right? Isn't that the right perspective? Boy, that doesn't have anything to do with these flaring, you know, programs, does it? Puts things in perspective. They now have a, a, a couple, a young couple that come to their church, and she was a foster girl of theirs. They, she was in their home. She got saved, and she was a handful of trouble. And now they're married, Jeremiah and Wendy, and they have a, a baby. Come to their church, just one after one, just one, one, just ministering in a small little thing there. I'm rebuked by this because I often have viewed ministry success as continually bigger and better budgets as uh, people, more and more of them, buildings and programs and bigger parking lots and things like that. I was reminded that local church is about individual people. Success is ministering to one or 1,000. The number really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Despite what Rick Warren says, true ministry is ministering to just whoever the Lord gives you to minister to. It's good. Second thing that we realize, we realize that America has a lot to learn about grace and kindness. From the moment that we hit Asian airspace, we land first, landed first in Tokyo, we realized that other countries are more friendly than ours, flat out. There's no way to dispute this. In Tokyo and all of Taiwan, the people are more gentle, they help you, they speak to you, they never fuss you, they never serve, they, they never uh, fail to serve you. And on the way back, we, I could tell when we made our exchange to American airspace, and when the, the stewards, or whatever they're supposed to be called now, I don't know what they're supposed to be called, you can't call them stewardesses, that's wrong or something, politically incorrect, when they, when, you know, you ask for something, they're like, you know, what a world of difference. I mean, it's just, they're American. That's the difference. And I don't want, I don't know, I don't want to kill you about your country, but I want to tell you, we're, we're definitely not a friendly country. The fact that we are foreigners even made it more amazing to me that we were intruding into their stores or whatever, and they took infinite amount of time to be delicate with us and to help us in language and everything. 
One morning in Taiwan, I was reading in 1 Peter, in chapter 2, and verse number 1, it says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envyings and all evil speakings. And I thought, I wish that Americans, I wish that I could do that. Laying aside those things. It's basically lo laying aside your attitude. And uh, it's amazing to me in America, we rush, we're impatient, we shoot off our mouths, we complain, we give people attitudes, we look down on people on a daily basis. And frankly, in Taiwan, we found unsaved people more gracious and displaying more of the fruit of the Spirit, worshiping idols, than Americans do who are filled with the Holy Spirit. How's that work? American Christians, I should say. You know, it's just a national, obviously, it's not Christ in their life. This is just a, a national kindness. You know, and we've missed that. So we've lost something in America. We don't even talk to our neighbors. We don't even, you know, when they're out in the yard, you know, we just don't, we just avoid them most of the time. Something is missing. I confess I'm the worst among you, and I've committed myself to change by God's power. If an unsaved Chinese can live in an attitude-free environment, then certainly believers can answer irritated and impatient people with the love of Christ on a daily basis. You know, the, the driving is very different, and I'm not going to go into this. I'm not going to steal your thunder. But uh, can you be polite and have 8,000 cars headed to you at one time? You can. You know, it's a country where road rage is invisible. It's amazing. Number three, we learned that, uh, or one thing that we experience is we're able to encourage, I hope and I believe Dave confirmed this morning, we're able to encourage the missionary. This is one of our highest priorities on this trip. We wanted to build up the, the pans. I don't know if you realize it, but uh, every month missionaries come off the field. They quit. No kidding. You know, it's hard. All right? They do. All right? We don't want any quitters. You know, we're not going to make fun of them if they do quit. You know, it's a very hard business. But uh, we want to encourage them so they don't quit. There are several places in Scripture where the Scriptures record the missionary Paul taking and needing great encouragement by people coming to him. Listen to one of them. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, 18. I'm glad for the, of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus and Achaeus. For that which was lacking on your part they have supplied, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge that ye them that are such. 2 Corinthians 7, 6, and 7. Nevertheless God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. All right? Uh, we wanted to encourage them, just like Paul the missionary was encouraged. But... Uh, just, I want to make a, just a quick point to you. Never underestimate your ability personally to be able to encourage somebody through the gifts of the Holy Spirit that He's given you. You don't know what it means to people when you pick up the phone. You just don't. I found a card on my desk. I haven't even given it to Amy. Somebody left it there when we were away. Somebody, one of you. I appreciate it. I read it. Oh, it was important. It was great. It was so important. I got a card in the mail. The other day, yesterday or the day before. It's a handmade one. You don't know what that meant to us. You just don't know what that meant to us. Listen, can I tell you something? Do you realize that God comforts other people through you if you're willing? I love to hear, I watched, uh, I said I told you this morning, Jay, Jay's message, Jay Holland's message, and listen to it. And I love to hear him getting on you about running out of the church instead of ministering, staying and ministering to people. You know, you don't know what you're doing, and you don't even have to try to do it. There's a Spirit of God inside of you. It's doing it for He is doing it for you. Just go visit them. Just show up at the hospital. Just pick up the phone. Just write the card. The Lord will take care of the rest. And we wanted to be an encouragement to the pans. I was able to talk to Luke uh, for several times for a very long time. He confided in me. And for, when the first day we were there, I said, Luke, we'll do anything for you. We'll scrub the floors. We'll paint the church. We'll go soul winning. We'll preach. We'll sing. Anything you want us to do. Do you know what he really wanted us to do? Just to talk with them and to be with them. And we spent, they, they spent, we could tell at the end of the night when we went back to our room that they were disappointed. There was one day where we wanted to just have a family day, and Alyssa, my niece, and Amy and I, and we wanted to go and, and get souvenirs for people back home and ride our bikes in the Taiwan kind of thing area. You know, we wanted to do that, and I could tell that Luke was sad about that. They just wanted fellowship. Right. They wanted people that had, could, could feel their pain, 
that could uh, understand some of what they were going through and just love them for who they were. You know, we wanted to be an encouragement. We had an excellent fellowship with Dina and Luke. They are godly ministers of Christ, and I appreciate them a great deal. Luke whipped me all the time in ping pong, constantly, con <laughs> constantly. I told him I wasn't leaving Taiwan until I beat him one time. You know what? I lied because I didn't beat him one time. And uh, they have three. They have three floors uh, in a in a straight up in a in like a townhouse kind of thing. It's connected, and uh, they had a ping pong table up up there that was owned by the people that that rent their I'm giving you way too much information. But they had a ping pong table up there. And so we were playing, playing, playing. And I'm trying to play so hard to beat him. And he would fall on the ground laughing at me missing shots. He was dying. He was literally, I mean, he was on the ground just laughing in Taiwanese or Chinese, Mandarin or whatever he was laughing at. You know? But, one, but the, the point is that he, he really needed that. And I could tell that he needed it. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get that fellowship, and it was a, a great time. We liked, uh, we had a very similar sense of humor and enjoyed playing jokes and letting off some steam and driving down the road and rolling down the window, windows. You got to understand, nobody speaks English over there. It is, n there is no one, you know, there's no one. The little kids are the best shot because they're trying to teach them, in, you know, in, in class, but they don't know, you know, you are way out of your element. So we rolled down the window. We rolled down the window. We're driving down, and I'd, I'd lean out and say, hey, what's up? And they'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, they had no idea what I was saying, you know. And I'd, I'd yell out, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? You know, and they, they would just be like, they would. <laughs> Anyhow, the fourth thing is that, and, and by the way, Amy and Dina were able to talk also, and uh, Luke was able to share some hardships of ministry, and we sat in, a, of all places, a Japanese restaurant uh, one day. That was the restaurant where the rat ran across the floor. We went there the second time. I just wanted to see the rat again. <laughs> and uh, we were sitting there, and we got to talking about, you know, inner workings of ministry, and just, it's the same thing. Doesn't matter what country you are, some of the same things happen in ministry. Same thing. And Luke was, oh, it's so right. Oh, you know, we're just talking about it. We're just hamming it up as pastor to pastor. It was good. It was very good. Number four, we were able to experience the grace needed to be an American missionary on the field. Dina has a great testimony of God's grace and, and is a willing servant. There are many things uh, that are greatly different about Taiwan, but she lives in joy and compassion without any complaint. We didn't hear a complaint at all. And uh, we found her a great testimony of patience and of the fruit of the Spirit. She was always joyful. She was always encouraging. She just acted like she was from Taiwan. You could not have told a difference in her conversation. Understand that she is very, very good, and there's no difference in their speech. She has whatever she can say. She can talk just like them, Rosh. She just say, just talk like them, and she just acts like a Taiwanese. There's like no difference at all, and you know, they, you know, I don't know if they accept her, but she sure does accept them. And it didn't seem to matter to her that you couldn't flush the toilet paper. It didn't seem to matter at all that you know the food was unidentifiable. You know, it didn't matter the, you know, the chicken legs or the chicken feet or whatever they are on a stick. didn't matter to her a bit. didn't matter to him. Just part of life. What grace that takes, folks. You have to be called. You know, it's one thing to, you know, I, I mean this. You know, it's great. You, you go over there for a month. That's fine. But she's been there years. And she could sit around pining for the cushiness of what she calls a fabric house. But she doesn't do it. You know what that is? A fabric house is what every one of us in here lives in. You know, the sofa has fabric on it. It's not vogue to have a fabric sofa. In Taiwan, they have wooden sofas. And the, every floor is hard. And everything is hard. The walls are concrete. Okay? We, that, that's rough for me. And the bed, I believe the bed was concrete too. <laughs> Not in their house. We, we, they, we stayed in a hostel. I don't even know how to pronounce it. A hostel or whatever. It was, it was very nice, but it was, it was very adequate. It was very, very good. There were no bugs or anything like that. But it was, you know, it was Taiwan. It was welcome to Taiwan. We realize that, Amer that missionary sacrifice is not so much leaving everything behind. You know, when, we, when they're raising support here, we say, oh, they have to sell their whole house or whatever. That's not the, the sacrifice. The sacrifice is after you've been there for five years and you're standing in lines and, and trying to, to do things. 
That's the sacrifice. It's not the sacrifice of the immediate selling of things. It's the living day after day when everything has, has worn off about being a missionary and there's nobody sending you any cards. The only, buddy that, the only person that emails you is Lighthouse Baptist Church and Jane Murray who sends cards. That's the only thing you get. Okay? It all wears off. And it's just you and Luke and your boys and an empty church. It's real life, buddy. That's real ministry. It's rough. It's like some of the things found in Acts. It takes great grace every day dealing with different food and lines and driving and practices and utilities and everything. It is a great test. Dina is a great testimony of the fruit of the Spirit. And I know that Donna and Dave are sitting there thinking it's because of us. You know, I'm sure it is. <laughs> but uh, I tell you what, we were just thoroughly impressed. We really were. We were just encouraged. Number five, we were able to understand the financial need of the particular missionary and be a small blessing to them. It's flat out more expensive to live in Taiwan than, uh, than a lot of ways to live in America. We really make a mistake when we think it's not. You must factor in that necessities that you're used to are a premium on the foreign field. American necessities that you're used to are a premium on the foreign field. Uh, it's not too far from ours in this illustration, but $4 for a gallon of gas, $4 for a gallon of milk, pizza for a family, a regular family. Ellsworth's here go out to eat. It would be 45 bucks for pizza to pick it up and bring it home. Now, that's American food, and that's why it's that, that expensive. But you can't get regular. You can't get what we would deem as regular kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's a lot different. And the, whereas the rent is cheaper, they have insurance, uh, insurance fees that are several hundred, hundreds of dollars twice a year. So, you know, they pay insurance fees of like $800 twice a year on what was supposed to be their renting whatever and on their vehicles. And, and so when you go factor it, they, they in Taiwan need at least what we have, what we, uh, have for an income here. And not only that, they're running a church on it on the money. So they're, they're supplying for their church. The, the people, the handful of people are not going to spend the bills. They're not going to provide the bills to the church, the lights and all that stuff. So I kind of, my eyes came and come, kind of forward, kind of open, excuse me, about that. Dina and Luke, I believe if my fact, my numbers are right, from America receive about $1,200 a month. Okay. They're coming back. We need to desperately pray. They're in 14 or 15 new churches. We need to desperately pray, pray that every one of them support them. Okay, I'm just going to tell you something straight off. There's a, couple, there's a couple churches they're hitting around here. They're staying in the haven of rest. They're going to hit on a Sunday night around here. And I love you, but Pastor Valiente is going to preach here, and I'm going to go beg for them in that church. And I'm going to say what they can't say. I'm going to tell them, I've been there. They need you to support them. Please support them. You know, they can't say that. They don't have, if Luke opened his mouth and said that, they would, they would oh, he's a greedy missionary. You know, I've seen where they live. They, they live, they don't live in poverty. They live in basic necessity. Okay? All right. I hope I'm not embarrassed you, Frost. The cost of the trip was more expensive than we originally anticipated because we wanted to take care of everything. We wouldn't let them pay for anything. When we went there, we paid for all the food for the family. We took them out, took them out when it was neat. We needed to go out, and we, uh, we bought them groceries and stocked their groceries and everything that we possibly could. Our niece was able, she was able to raise additional support, and she left them several hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars. And uh, I believe some of you sent money. I asked you to send cards with you. So we were able to leave a little bit. I wish I, wish I would, we would have had some cash to, to leave them. Number six, we were able to challenge them to greater evangelism. Frankly, I want to be honest with you, I believe that Luke is discouraged about evangelism because there's so few results in that Buddhist country. They give out the gospel regularly and, and all the time. But the fact is the people, they want our clothing. They want to see American words. They like the coolness of American rock groups. But they don't want our religion. Could that be because we're such a poor testimony? Could that be because if they say, they look at America and say, if that imperialistic, materialistic society is what Christianity is all about, I don't want any of it? The churches that are there, if you read the blog, you read the pastor's heart, you saw me downing the Southern Baptist Church there. And you read the blog and you understand why. Southern Baptist Church uh, takes groups of Taiwanese people uh, to Korea to learn how to speak in tongues and to anoint in oil and all the charismatic stuff. This is the Southern Baptist Church that f pours in money. The building's beautiful and people, fly, people come to it. And then they give them false doctrine. Every fourth Sunday, a woman preaches. Local Southern Baptist Church. Isn't that great? 
That's why the American churches that are involved in Southern Baptist Convention are giving their money to support that. That's what they're supporting. All right. We're able to encourage Luke, though. We pass out tracts, Luke and Dean, we pass out tracts at the market, try to be a good example to the pans to keep giving out the gospel despite what they would like to see in results, to keep on giving it out and letting the Word of God win people to Christ, but to keep on keeping on. It's very hard. I want to explain something to you. What if we went uh, out soul winning week after week after week after week after week and year after year after year, and we, we really couldn't point to anything for it? It would be hard, wouldn't it? You know, the Lord has blessed us with some little results in our SWAT and whatever, and we pray. I praise God. I hold on to that. I'm encouraged by that. But I want you to understand that I believe that Luke and Dean are, are discouraged with evangelism. We try to encourage them. There's a young man named Jeremiah there who is a young married man in the church. We encouraged him to, uh, to evangelize, to get out soul winning, to get out handing out tracts. We were playing basketball. You'll see it in the video in a community uh, park. And there's young men that Luke and him uh, play basketball with every week. And uh, we were able to sit them all down, and Luke translated for me, and I was able to go, go my whole testimony and give them the gospel very clearly. They were riveted on hearing the gospel. It's amazing to me that those young men had never clearly heard the gospel ever in their lives, ever. Dina said that she heard listening to a local radio station, and they were talking about American Christmas, and they said, of course, we know what Christmas is. It's Santa Claus's birthday. And that was the common belief. There, it's not like America, folks. Lastly, we were able to preach and minister the Scripture. I was able to preach at Luke's church and the English-speaking church there that other English missionaries come to. Uh, I, Amy and I were able to sing, and she played the piano in the uh, English-speaking church. Alyssa, our niece, was able to give her testimony to the teens and to give a devotional. Amy was supposed to give a devotional to the women, but that didn't work out. It was exciting to minister to these needy people and it was interesting preaching again through an interpreter or, or a, uh, what do they call them, interrupter. Uh, that was kind of weird. But uh, you'll see a little bit of that tonight. But it was good to know, it's great to know, that we have some brothers and sisters in Christ literally halfway around the world that are trying to give out the gospel and, and fulfill the Great Commission. They are our arm. They are our people. They are our family. I cannot tell you how much we're responsible for them. And they're going to come back here at the beginning of September. All baby today. It's, my, it's Mike's fault. I don't know why, but it is. They're going to come back here at the beginning of September. They're going to stay at the Haven of Rest, and we're going to love them. And if you, don't, if you forget to love them, I'm going to jab you in the back and say, you've got to love these people. You know, they're, they're, they should be your kids' heroes, honestly. You ought to have them over to your house. You ought to sit and talk with them and ask them what it's like. For, not for your encouragement, for their encouragement. For your kids to be encouraged about going to the mission field, serving Jesus. And uh, appreciate, again, uh, Dave and his encouragement for us to go.